Luke chapter 21. I want you to look at verse number 37. Verse number 37. And in the daytime. I want you to underline that right there. And in the daytime, he was where? Teaching where? In the temple. And at night. I want you to underline that. And at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. Now, where was he at during the day? In the temple doing what? Teaching. Where was he at night? He was on the mount. When I, I have my study Bible right here in front of me, and when I got to this particular set of verses, and I'm going to switch back and forth, and no, I'm not preaching two sermons tonight. I know y'all got scared when you saw two Bibles. But in my, in my study Bible, I underlined when I got to Luke 21 in the very last verse, and, and I underline, and in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out. So I, I got into chapter 22, and I read all the way through, and uh, came down to verse number 39 of chapter 22. Are you there? Uh, chapter 22 and verse number 39. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of what? Olives. Now, now all of a sudden, I underlined that. And I was like, okay, at nighttime, at daytime, he was in the temple. At nighttime, he was on the mount. And then go down to verse number 66. And, and I'm trying to show you how this led up to the sermon for tonight. Verse number 66. And as soon as it was what? Day. So you have the night. The day he's in the temple. The night he's on the Mount of Olives. We come down to verse number uh, in chapter 22, verse number 39, and I find out that he came out and went as he was wont, that was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. So in my finite mind, I'm sitting here going, okay, well then if he's at the Mount, we must now be in the evening time, in the night time, because that's what it told us he did, that was his schedule. Then look at verse 66, and as soon as it was what? Day. The elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him uh, into their council saying. So the Bible tells us and gives us insight, and I'm headed someplace, and, and I'll be honest with you, I wrote in my study Bible, I'm not quite sure this is going to make sense to anybody else, but it sure made sense to me. Daytime, Jesus is teaching in the temple. Nighttime, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. You come into the chapter and you'll find out it's the Passover in Luke chapter 22. And then he goes all the way through his schedule. Then in verse 39, he goes to the mount. From verse 39 to verse 66, everything that happened in those passages happened at the nighttime. Because then when it's day, everything begins to click. When he ended his day, he went to the mount. So everywhere between verse number 39 of Luke 22 to verse number 66, it was the night. The Holy Spirit impressed upon me for my life, and I think the best kind of sermons are those that, that changes the pastor's life. You and I are not truly who we are in the daytime. You and I are truly who we are at the nighttime. You're not who I see right now. You are the church member, you. You are the singing group, you. You are the usher, you. You are the deacon, you. You are the you that's sitting there. But can I tell you something? It's the night times that tell us who you really are. And out beside the night time, I wrote these couple of things down for me. It is who I am when I crawl in bed and I'm laying there getting ready to fall asleep and it's just me and my thoughts. Whatever's happening right then, that's who I really am. It is me when I'm getting ready in the morning and it's just me looking into the mirror. And it's just me alone with my thoughts, that's who I really am. It's me when I'm getting in my car and I'm driving to the church house to get ready for work and to get my day started and I unlock that glass door and I walk in and sit behind my desk and it's very quiet. That's who I really am. It's the time that I walk back into my office after maybe counseling or in a meeting and I have that brief five minutes. Whatever happens up here and in here, that's who I really am. 
It's those times when I leave the office and I go to lunch and I have 15 minutes maybe to drive someplace alone in that car. Whatever I'm confronted with in the mirror of my soul, that is who I really am. You see, during the day, I'm busy like Christ was. You're busy like Christ was. And Christ is having to take care of business. He's talking to the disciples about their day. He's having to deal with the drama of the chief priests and scribes. He then deals with Judas. He deals with the Passover. They secure the upper room. They break the bread and drink the juice for the Lord's Supper. He teaches a lesson. And everything that happens between verse number 1 of Luke 22 and verse number 39, that's what Christ was doing during the day. My lesson tonight is very simple. Your routine of what you have to take care of. Dad, you got to get up and go to work tomorrow. But while you're working and while you're busy, that's not the real you. The real you is when you get a break in the action and it becomes nighttime in who you are. When you are alone with you. Mama, it's when you get all the kids off to school. And all of a sudden, you get the husband gone. You get the kids gone. And the house becomes quiet. And you are brought to reality with your thoughts about who you really are. Please listen to me very closely. I'm afraid we don't like who we are. I'm afraid we don't take advantage of the downtime to figure out who we really are. Because when nobody's talking and nothing's in your ears and nothing's coming through the earbuds and you are alone, probably the best thing that would ever happen to this society is if we lost all internet connection. Probably the best thing would ever happen to this society is if we lost all cell towers around us. And we were left with nothing but the sound of our own beating heart. I don't think we know who we are. And I found it very interesting when I came to these set of verses, I thought to myself, I wonder from the time he goes to the mount to the time the day breaks, how many groups of people were found right there? I found five groups of people that I want to point out to you tonight that when you're left alone with yourself, and just you and your thoughts. It's just you and what you've done. It's just you and who you truly are. I was reminded of a story that the king had died, and in his will he left his son all the money of the kingdom. And in leaving his son all the money of the kingdom, the lawyer or the, the, the man that was probating the will and making sure everything was done he called the son in and he said, of course, you have inherited everything, but your father makes one stipulation. And he knew his son was a riotous man. He knew his son would spend all the money and go party it up. And he knew that about his son. But he said, your father only asks one thing and the money's yours. You have to agree to it. And that is this. At the end of every day, you will take 30 minutes and think about you and your behavior during the day. The son said, that's the only stipulation. He's like, that's the only stipulation. So the son agreed to the stipulation, and the son said, all right, I'll do it. First day, he partied like, like, there, 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 like there was an endless amount of money and, uh, and, and lived a very riotous life, a life that was out of control. He came dragging in uh, toward the end of the day and realized that he had not kept his dad's only wish. So he sat on the edge of the bed and thought for 30 minutes. After the 30 minutes was up and he thought it was a waste of time, he went to bed, woke up the next day and began the spending and began the, the, the life of just an out-of-control lifestyle. Got to the end of the day, sat on the bed, took 30 minutes. The more time he took throughout the weeks to come, you probably have already guessed. He started thinking about his behavior. He started thinking about who he really was, what he was really all about. And he became so disgusted with himself and his behavior that just coming to himself made him change who he was. Do you know why I don't think we change? Is because we don't have time to look into the mirror of our soul and to really take inventory of who we really are. What are you really? What have we become? What has the day forced us to come out at nighttime as? Tonight I'm going to preach on this subject. Who do you become at night? Who do you become at night? And I'm not talking about the physical night. I'm talking about those times to where it's just you. It's just you. It, it is just you. 
in that time with you and your drive. You and being at home by yourself. You and being out of town, businessmen. You and being by yourself in the hotel. And you being by yourself in a strange city. And just you by yourself. Who are you really? And I found five groups that I thought were very interesting that we're going to go through. Let's get into them and then we're done. Look at Luke 22 verse 40. The first group that I find at nighttime are the seekers. The seekers. And that would be Jesus Christ. Look at Luke 22 verse 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and did what? prayed. What was he praying for? He was praying for the will of God. When he was by himself, when Jesus was by himself and it was nighttime, his prayers and his thoughts were consumed with this. God, I hope I'm doing your will. God, I want you to be pleased with me. God, I'm facing a circumstance that I can go this way or I can go that way, but God, I want you pleased with me. Can I ask you a question this morning? Are you a seeker when you're by yourself? When it's just you and your thoughts and it's just you in about five minutes and it's you in between where you have to go and it's you in the car and it's you late at night and when you men finish your day's work and you come home and you sit down in the chair, what consumes you? What are those thoughts? What is that motivation? What are you all about? And are you all about God, I want you pleased with me. God, I want your will. I don't want my will. Mom, when it's just you in an empty house and you hear the second hand on that wall clock and it's just ticking and you hear it, is that who you are? Are you a seeker? I can tell you this. I want to be a seeker. I want to be the type of husband. I want to be the type of father that when I have downtime, that I'm spending the downtime I'm spending the night time because I know I'm getting ready in verse 66 to get into the day. And you know why we have no power during the day of our life? It's because we waste the night times of our life. God meant for you to be someone who spends time alone with him. That's why I truly believe when they would, they would, they would saddle that horse and the reason we had revival break out in days gone by is because the man of God had time on horseback to ride for miles and beg a God of heaven to come down and do what God wants to do. Now the average preacher can be at the house of God in five minutes. In ten minutes he's up behind the pulpit preaching and not spending one, one moment season in prayer, God. Would you do something? You hear these revivals breaking out. I promise you, they broke out because somebody on the downtime was spending time with God. What did one great man of God say? Every failure is a prayer failure. You know why it's a prayer failure? Because we're in tune with Sirius XM Radio and we're in tune with the downtime of this and of that. Why don't we just shut life off when we've got downtime and spend it with the Creator who created us and He's got a will for us and I think we always need to be praying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. At the nighttime, these groups started coming out of the fabric of the setting of the crucifixion. There was the seekers. Can I tell you, second of all, there were the sleepers. Look at Luke 22 and verse 40. Luke 22 and verse 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them what? Sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise and pray. Do you know how they spent their night time? Asleep with no concern for people around them. The Savior was in agony. In fact, there's other places in the, in the Gospels, the synopsis of this, when you trace it out, he said, there was no one to watch me sorrow. Can I tell you something? On your downtime, 
Have you blocked out everybody's concern around you? Is that how we spend our travel time? Is that how we spend our alone time? I don't think the Christian life is built by what you get from behind the pulpit. I think the Christian life is built by the time you have alone that is your time alone. And I think we have to get concerned. You know why there's no public care for a world dying and going to hell? Because there's no private thinking about a world dying and going to hell. You know why there's no public expression of love toward people? Because there's no private thinking about people that are going through a tough time. You ought to take that prayer list and you ought to have that prayer list in front of you and during the downtime sit and think about the Hamilton who now for the Hamiltons told me that now mom's paralyzed from the waist down and can I start thinking about those times I just got back from a a member who's lost 45 pounds in a month it's not long Think about your friends going through a tough time. Think about those bus kids on that bus route. But we have so drowned out the cares of other people that when we have downtime, it's on our Kindle. And when we have downtime, it's playing games. And when we have downtime, it's watching TV. All of us need to be revived that when we have downtime, why are we not spending it thinking about others' agony? It was nighttime. The sleepers came out. They, 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 they could have pulled up a chair. And they could have pulled that chair up to the side to where Jesus was. And they could have watched Jesus as great sweat drops of blood came out of his brow. And they could have said, that's our Savior. Boy, is he going through it. He's going to be crucified. But they decided that they would sleep with no concern. God help us if our attitude is, what's well, my downtime? I've worked hard all day. I just want to block everything out of my mind. And that's why people turn to prescription drugs. And that's why people turn to alcohol. Because they can't handle the quiet time. That's why it's hard to hold an invitation together. Because we're not used to the quiet time. That, that, that's why it's hard To shut off everything in the house and just go find a chair and just sit down. Why? Because at nighttime, sleepers come out. I'm not concerned. I'll go to sleep. I'm not concerned with the agony. I'm not concerned with what's going on over there. The first group was this. The first group were the seekers. That's what I want to be. The second group was the sleepers. I I don't want to be that. I got to be honest with you. You hear so much as a Christian about people's problems and what people go through, that it is very easy to say, I'm going to flip a switch, I'm done, I don't want to think about it. But you know what? I have to work on my compassion. You have to work on your compassion. And part of that is, when it's just you, does your heart ache for people going through it? Boy. There's stories right now that as a pastor I can't tell until decades from right now. But I can tell you this. The thing that keeps my heart warm is when I start thinking about people and what they're going through. And taking the time to think will help you more than what you realize it will help you. How do you get that friendly, outgoing personality? It's because you took time at the nighttime to think about the people Take the time to think. The third group that came out at night, look at verse 47. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? When they, were, when they, when they which were about him saw what, what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? You have the third group that came out were the betrayers. The betrayers. Now when you think about the betrayers, Judas came out. You know what Judas said? I'm going to sacrifice Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I'm going to give up him for what pleases me. 30 pieces of silver. It is not you standing, holding, and reading your Bible in public. But I, 
wonder how many teenagers have given up their time with Jesus to look good for the day. You see that downtime in the morning when it's just you. What is more compelling in your soul? To look good or to spend time with Jesus? I wonder how many people have said, you know, it's downtime. And I know I haven't spent time with Jesus yet, but, but I'll do it later and he will understand. Can I tell you? We don't want to be betrayers at night. We don't want to take the downtime when we could spend it with Jesus. And let me give you a little hint about life. If you've got downtime and you've not yet spent it with Jesus, and you spend it on any other thing besides Jesus Christ, then you betrayed him with a kiss. You betrayed him by, he'll understand. I only have a few minutes to myself. He'll understand. I only have this to myself. And I have to spend it on me because I have to look good. And I have to make the money. And I have to get involved. And I have to know what's going on. May there be a revival of everyone in this church that we are not known as a betrayer. I understand you're busy. I understand you have a lot of things going on. But that first downtime mama, don't turn the TV on. Don't get on social networking. Don't call up your best friend. Get your Bible and get on your knees and spend it with the Almighty. Don't betray him. Teenager, better you go to school disheveled but having spent time with the master than it would be to betray him. Dad, be better for you to take that first break at work, that first 15, 20 minute break. Maybe you didn't get up and spend time with him. Okay, so you're busy. But the first time the nighttime hits, why don't you get that Bible and go to your pickup truck and disappear and open the Bible. Don't betray him. For wanting to be accepted. Don't betray him for wanting something. The betrayers. So you have the seekers came out at night. The sleepers came out at night. The betrayers came out at night. And then look at verse number 54 if you will. Verse number 54. Look at it. Luke twenty-two fifty-four. Then took they him and led him. And brought him into the, into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth. This fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he spake, uh, the, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. You know the fourth group to come out at night? The deniers. Let's just get honest. All of us have been in a situation to where that crowd needed to know we were a Christian. And that crowd needed to know we believe in Jesus Christ. And that crowd needed to know that we operate by the Bible. Every one of us have been there to where we had a chance to stand up for him. But when the nighttime hit, we couldn't even Stand up for him. You listen to me. This week, when the night time hits, are you going to be the one that's going to be a denier? And when you're by yourself, and it's just you, many of you men drive a long ways, and you work a lot out of town, and you're always in a different spot, and stepping in, they only know you as a businessman. Can I tell you? You'll be put in a spot to where you'll have to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. You won't be like the LBT maintenance men around here that have an LBT shirt with your name on the side. That already tell people where you're from. And at some point, you can't be a denier. 
We've all been there, haven't we? Should have said something. Should have stood up for him. But we were a denier. You see, when you're with yourself and you're by yourself and it's just you, your thoughts around strange people, that's who you truly are. It's easy to stand up am amongst the disciples and say something, but when you're by yourself, that's the true test. You have these, you have the seekers, you have the sleepers, you have the betrayers, you have the deniers, and then the fifth group that you have, look at verse 49. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? The sleepers woke up. Verse number 50. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, red letter, here we go. You ready? Suffer ye thus far. Now listen to me. When things get going tough and you're by yourself, what is your reaction to the circumstance you're in? Is your reaction one of plotting to fight? Or is your reaction one of, God help me to survive? You see, who you are at the night, who you are when things get tough, who you are when you're by yourself at your truck and you're by yourself at the sink and you're by yourself and things are tough and you're thinking to yourself, I could just walk away from it all and I can fight this. You know, you know what the Lord said? The Lord said, suffer ye thus far. You know what he was saying? You've come this far putting up with the junk. Can't you go just a little bit farther? You've already gotten three quarters of the way into this journey. Can't you just go a little, it's just a couple more chapters and I come out of the grave victorious. Can we not just suffer a little bit more? And how many people quit in their mind and heart when they're alone and then when the day breaks, they quit the second time? You see, when somebody quits on God in the daytime, that's not the first time they quit on God. They quit on God in their heart the first time when they were alone. I'll tell you this much. Who are you when the night happens? Who are you when you're by yourself? Who are you when it's just you? Are you a seeker? Are you a sleeper? Are you a denier? Are you someone who's a sufferer? And the last one is this. Then you had verse 63, and I'm done. Look at verse 63. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. The last group is this, mockers. Mockers. When you're by yourself, what is the real you? You, you see, some people think that they can take a slap at God and that because they think he is bound by his long suffering, and he's bound by his mercy, and he's blindfolded by his love, that he won't strike back. You see, the only reason they had guts enough to strike the Son of God is because he was bound. So they thought, here's our opportunity. Who hit you? Prophesy unto us. And the Bible said they were so bold that blasphemously they were doing things to the Son of God. Can I ask you a question? When you're by yourself, are you being injurious to Christ who saved you? You see, he was getting ready to go to the cross and die for them. What are your actions while you're by yourself? What do you truly do when you're away from your wife? What do you truly do when you're away from your husband? Teenagers, what are you doing? on that Kindle? What are you doing on that computer? What is going through that phone? What is the pipeline? Are we being mockers at the nighttime? Hey, let me tell you something. All five of these, six of these convicted me. Can I tell you the conviction? Are you ready? Number one, I want to spend my time seeking what God wants me to do. Number two, I want to spend my time thinking 
about others who have it bad. Number three, I want to spend my time making sure he gets first place and I've not betrayed him for anything else that I really want to do. I want to be the one who stands up for Christ. I don't want to deny. And I want to be the guy that in the aloneness with my thoughts and I get a little bit overwhelmed at the circumstance, I want to be the guy who says, I've suffered this far. I'm going to suffer a little bit longer. And I want to be the guy that I never do anything privately that would injure our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to take advantage of his long suffering, his grace, his love, and make a mockery of the fact that he's bound by being a God of a second and third and fourth chance that I live a riotous life. I'm done with this right here. Who are you at night? Who are you at night? I don't know if this has made sense to anybody in this room, but it sure helped me. Who are you at night? I would ask you that if you've got some things to fix in your life, let's get it fixed. And I'll tell you why. Because it's going to dawn into a day. Those factors at night played a big role in what happened during the day. I don't have time to go through them because this half is sweating. This half is sweating. We are okay because we have the breeze. Not for breeze, but the breeze. But you study the chapters after that, and you're going to find out everybody played a role during the day. Please listen to me. What I'm looking at right now is not the real Christian. It's what you do when you're alone. And teenagers and college students, listen to your pastor. What you are in your heart while you please everybody in the flesh will come out one day. And if you're not playing it straight with God in your heart, when you get to that point where you feel like you owe nobody an explanation, you'll run and do whatever you want to do. Let's fix it in the heart. Boy, I want to be that kind of Christian. I want God to be pleased with my life. And at night, those alone times, I want to be the right kind of Christian. Heavenly Father,